Hello and welcome to Sweet Spot DFS. This is a recap video for the 2020 AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am. Nick Taylor won, which is awesome. If you guys don't know who he is or if you've never heard of him, I'm sure you have, but if you haven't, he's he's known as a ball striker. Uh, has some of the best wedge play, some of the best iron play just on tour. He's known for not being able to putt. He will have some of the worst putting stats you, can, you, you will ever see. Uh, but... Hey, when things align, when the putting is on with the rest of the with the rest of the game, things like this will happen. And a lot of people around the DFS industry will also echo the same thing. It's only a matter of time before one of these ball strikers with poor putting stats, like a Hideki Matsuyama, is going to win a golf tournament. So, kudos to Nick Taylor. This is his first victory in a long time. Uh, he only has one other. Uh, win on tour which was the sanderson farms championship that was when it was an alternate event side by side to the world golf championship so the field was much weaker um uh, this is more of like a real win in my opinion so it was good phil ran out of gas at the end uh but nick taylor didn't falter it looked like he might have but he didn't let's go ahead and get into the uh, spreadsheet i always pull up the recent form tab we go over the optimal lineup and whatever gpp like the biggest one that I've that I played in that week, we go over the winning lineup for that as well. So right off the cuff, uh, the five dollar GPP winning lineup consisted of Nick Taylor, Kevin Streelman, Phil Mickelson, Jason Day, Ches Reeve at twenty fifth place, and then Scott Stallings who missed the cut. Now, I I'm pretty sure I, I may not have said this during this. Of the preview video for this tournament but i did say it during the american express which is the exact same format uh three course rotation another pro-am basically uh and then there was a cut after that third round you didn't i, I had said it then i have seen tournaments where like DraftKings tournaments where the winning lineup had a missed cut in it it's possible he had the top four golfers which is remarkable i mean that is super good the rest of them just have to score enough points right the five dollar gpp winning lineup scored 601.5 points i believe he edged out a guy by 0.5 points um the optimal lineup however had 653.5 points so there was room to do better than what the five dollar gpp winning lineup did um and really if you take scott stallings away 7600 Obviously, the, the winners used all 50, so we need 76 or less. Well, you've got Maverick McNeely and Matt Jones right there, who obviously scored many more points. Could easily have done that to add with Chez. So I'm not taking anything away from him for the winner of the $5 GPP, but for us, like, you know, we had room to do better. Um, I did play quite a bit of Maverick McNeely. Actually, I did well during this tournament like I did uh, or during this week like I did last week. Last week I had a huge ROI. This week I had, uh, I ended up putting in $27, $28, like $27.95, uh, $28 and came out with $42. So nice little $14 profit. It was pretty great. A lot of that had to do with, um, I'm going to go ahead and get into the DK page. A lot of it had to do with me matching um me matching the the last year bucket and last week bucket and and how about this i'm gonna pull down the spreadsheet throw up my player pool that i had for um for my lineup construction video i wanted to look for golfers who had some tournament history i wanted to find golfers who had a high birdie or better percentage i also wanted to find golfers who had great poa stats to go with a monterey peninsula or a pebble beach start We'll go into the DraftKings uh, page here soon, or the spreadsheet, and I'll show you that really didn't apply. But then four and five is my bucket score system. I wanted to find one to two last year ones, and at least one of them be a last year one, last week one. Then I wanted to find one to three last year twos, with one or two of them being last year two, last week one. And if you don't know what the bucket system is, I, I explain it all the time throughout all my preview videos you can go find one of those um i think i also have a bucket video or a bucket system video out there as well that that explains it um so you can always 
go back and look at those. I'm not going to get into it here, but it's uh, it proved to be very helpful because again, you wanted one to two last year ones. Here are your last year ones, uh, and then one to two of them be last year one, last week one. So L Y B L L W B last year, last week. Here you go. One 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 one. I played a lot of Jason Day. He was on my thumbnail for both my preview video and my lineup construction video. I was all in on Jason Day. And in fact, if I pull up the um, lineup construction, uh, I have an, another spreadsheet where I create lineups. You can see what the ownership I had of Jason Day. I played 68 tournaments, I think it was. Yeah, 68. I played him in 48.53%. Um, so 33 of those 68 uh, lineups had Jason Day in it. Uh, I was really big on Patrick Cantlay. So after like day one, everything looked good. I mean, everything was going the right path. So it felt good. But here you go. Maverick McNeely. I told you I played a lot of them. It was primarily because he was a 2-1. So I looked at all my my two ones that I liked, all my favorite ones. Cantlay, McNeely, and Norin were my top three. Uh, I played a lot of McNeely with Norin and Cantlay and Day together. Um, it still left me the ability to make pretty decent lineups. Uh, as you can tell, I also played a lot of these guys here that really didn't do anything. Furick and Stallings missed the cut, so those kind of were, you know, not good. And then Russell Knox fit that uh, last year bucket one score that I was looking for. He also missed the cut, um, so that was pretty disappointing. Um, yeah, I, I did target the one ones and the two ones. Dustin Johnson was more of a, a FOMO, fear of missing out play. Cam Champ, I liked a lot of. Uh, I also targeted the last week ones quite a bit. Uh, and, you know, my lineups were put together pretty decently and uh, made me some money. So I have no complaints with how the, the process worked. So it felt good. Everything worked out. We can go ahead and get into, well, we can look at the bucket scores. So Nick Taylor was a 4-5. That was just... You know, his finishing position last year was 28th place. Not bad. Uh, his week prior finishing position was 49th, which wasn't really good. It wasn't a really good tell. This combination had never been inside the top 10 over the last six years. So that's why there's a 0% next to him. Uh, I did look at Nick Taylor primarily because his POA splits were good as well as his tournament history. And his recent form wasn't bad. I didn't play any of him. Uh, which is a bummer because obviously I missed out on those on those first place points, but it's fine. I made up with it with Streelman. I don't remember how much I owned of Streelman. I know I played some Streelman because he was in my $5 lineup, or was he at the top? Huh. Oh, here he is. So I played him in 8%, so six lineups. Not as much as I wanted to, but he was in my single bullet for my $5 GPP, and that's where I won, uh, won 30 bucks off of that. So obviously my just that alone um, covered my, my, my weekly entry fees. Also, the showdown slates, I hit two of them out of the, out of the four. Uh, I think I've got a really good way of doing showdowns. Uh, I flirted with first, first place uh, on the Friday round. And then the Sunday round, I mean, I was the highest, I think, was 18th place. So it looked good. Uh, Jason Day sputtered out. And then instead of picking Maverick McNeely, I went with um, uh, Matthew Neesmith, which I found out it's it's Naismith. It's, it's actually Naismith. The other commentator from the tournament before was calling him Nesmith. It's, it's Naismith, so now that I know, I can correct myself and go forward. But e either way, um, yeah, let's, let's stay on course. We'll talk about uh, the spreadsheet. I was telling you about the starting courses. Last year, we only saw three golfers uh, who golfed at Spyglass Hill, I think, of uh, the top 15. I think it was the top 15. Let's go look. So here are your finishing positions. Uh, one, two, three. Yeah, so top 15, you only had three golfers who started at Spyglass Hill. Um, this year, however, 
Oh, I'm sorry. We're going, we're going the wrong way. We had quite a bit, uh, quite a bit more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, well, we can take that nine away and say there was eight inside the top 15. A big reason for this, I had, I brought this up during the lineup construction video. It was basically the quality of golfer that started at any of these courses. This, I mean, if you look, Spyglass Hill had a bunch of good golfers. You had Cantlay, you had Streelman, Mickelson. Uh, we can give Homa his due and Kevin Na as well. It just mattered, you know, because in the 2019 uh, tournament for this, the results, I think there was like one notable golfer who was over $8,000 that started uh, at Spyglass Hill. So like, obviously those aren't the greatest of golfers. You had most of your golfers last year start at Monterey Peninsula. And that's why Monterey Peninsula showed up quite a bit. So it's really just looking to see which golfers are starting at which course and then kind of going from there um I, I don't know if there's much of an edge anymore but i will say this saturday's round of golf had a lot of wind and it had more wind at monterey peninsula than it did at any of the other courses so that's i mean how are you going to forecast that i mean there's no way you can you can look at what the wind is going to be like around the area but you're never going to know which course is going to get impacted more so than the other. Maybe maybe local knowledge would tell you that anything that any wind that comes from the north is going to affect one course or any wind that comes from the south will affect another, you know, that kind of thing. But for us, you know, that are trying to research DFS, we we're not going to know that kind of thing. So I don't think I'm really going to worry too much about starting course uh for this tournament. I I still will look at it, but I I don't think I'm going to really put a lot of um a lot of my eggs in that basket. I don't see anybody. Well, actually, we had Maverick McNeely and Kevin Streelman together. Oh, that's not right. This is where it gets all messy. Yeah, let's. I was gonna say let's try to find golfers that golf together, but I'm not going to. You guys can obviously pause the video and look to see what uh, tee times match up with which course and which hole, and figure that out. But I, I really didn't see anything. Uh, I didn't really put much. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? I always try to find this word whenever I'm talking. I, I just didn't put much investment in on starting course or starting hole or anything like that. Or I should say starting time. I, I saw some guys together and I'm like, oh my God, that's a really good lineup. Like that's that's who I want to to target, but I don't see anything here. I mean, you it was close with Day and Mickels, or Taylor, sorry. They were really close to each other, but anyways um let's go ahead and hide some of this information yeah let's hide all of this right here we don't need to see this um i'm also going to move it in a little bit let's go ahead talk about uh well let's talk about tournament history like i said we wanted to find golfers who had some really matthew naismith is the only golfer that i would say did not have well Charles Schwartzel also had not had, had not had, didn't have a uh, tournament history, but he had played at Pebble Beach before. Naismith is kind of a true rookie. Um, let's go ahead and hide this too, so we can just see the place. There we go. Um, an 11th place, not inside the top 10, so I'm not really worried about playing Matthew Naismith. Uh, 7,100, obviously you had better plays that you could have chosen from including Schwartzel. Uh, but yeah, you wanted some tournament history. To go along with that, I said you wanted to find some good recent form or just decent recent form. Streelman and Mickelson didn't really have the greatest recent form. Now, Mickelson came from Saudi Arabia the week before, finished third there. So like he, you know, had good, like most recent form. He had good last week, although I don't, I don't, pull in any last week information from European uh, tournaments. So I don't include that in my recent form. I don't think I'm going to. I might eventually, but it's not going to be anytime soon. Uh, Streelman, that was kind of, I'm not sure what happened, you know, to make his recent form so terrible. But either way, 
some of these golfers here, actually these golfers here, you wouldn't have, you know, chosen based off a of recent form because it, it didn't look good. But that's where those bucket scores come into play. Um, you know, Matt Jones being a 5-3, Jordan Spieth being a 5-3. I still wouldn't have played Matt Jones, and I definitely didn't play Jordan Spieth. I didn't care to. Uh, he did have a good finishing round. I will say this. Don't look into it. It was very windy, meaning he had to play wind shots. Maybe, maybe actually thinking about it, play Jordan when it's windy. That way he has to like swing the golf club a different way because whatever he's doing now is not working unless there's, you know, wind. So that's all I'm going to say. I, I, I'm still going to stay away from Jordan Spieth. I will not be playing him next week um, unless the bucket scores show up and say, hey, this is actually not a bad play. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going strictly by bucket score. I will not be playing Jordan Spieth. Jordan Spieth, although he made the top 10, wouldn't have uh, really helped you out with his salary, you know, trying to find a good, a good, um, a good lineup with him in it. Anyways, recent form, difficult to gauge. I, yeah, I'm not going to put much stock into it. There we go. That's the word I was looking for, stock. I'm not going to put a lot of stock into it. We go over POA history. I think the reason that I liked Nick Taylor was because this 9.38% of finding the top 10 is actually a good number. Uh, and 2020 post uh, splits, pretty decent as well. Overall, not bad. And that goes with all of these guys here. That's not bad. Uh, if I were to sort, you you find a bunch of golfers inside the top 20. So post splits actually mattered this week. I had said for the 2019, it didn't matter unless you started at Monterey Peninsula. So actually, let's let's look. Let's see, starting course. Monterey, so that works. <laughs> Monterey. Uh, spyglass, Spyglass, Monterey. Spyglass, Spyglass. Okay. So it, it kind of did, but it didn't. You know, say it, it, kind of just an interesting, I don't know. I don't know what you want to call it. it it's, it's interesting to see that. But, um, okay, let's go back and sort by result. Still, that's good. I would have stayed away from these guys, you know, starting them in my week-long uh, DFS, and same with these guys. However, finding these percentages, pretty decent. Maverick McNeely didn't have a lot of tournaments under his belt, but I still would consider six enough to find success. But 49.33 and 33.50 for 7,300, not bad. Uh, same applies for Matt Jones. Like, that's not bad. I don't really like seeing the 73, but 5.26, it's not bad. Um, Daniel Berger, a lot of things were proving to be the week. This this was going to be the week he was going to do well. He sure did. The Poe splits definitely um, look to be advantageous. At least they looked to help out in trying to – and into playing him. Uh, not really going to go – on about the 2020 POA splits. We can go ahead and hide this information. Um, and this one is, uh, we can keep it up. So really when it comes down to it, uh, did, I shouldn't say when it comes down to, that makes it sound way way more dramatic than what I, I care for it to be. Uh, I did say putting. I thought putting to go along with birdie or better during my lineup construction was gonna be very helpful. And it sure was for a lot of these golfers, which is surprising. Um, I shouldn't say surprising. It's just interesting. I, I I didn't really put a lot of stock into that. I said it, but I didn't really think too much about it. Birdie or better for these top four golfers, not the greatest. You know, that's leading up to this tournament. That's not at this tournament. Um, but we know Phil Mickelson makes a lot of birdies. Uh, Jason Day can make a lot of birdies. It just wasn't, you know, this light green means they're were, they were phenomenal leading up into the tournament. And really, Berger, McNeely, those two golfers, that's another reason why I like McNeely. Uh, same with Lanto and also Patrick Hanley. So I still think we, we want to look at that stuff. Uh, as long as it's not like this dark red color, which is bottom of the pack, bottom half of the pack, uh, light red and up would have been middle of the pack. So it's not bad to look at. 
really difficult to like look at someone like Kevin Streelman and say, oh yeah, I know what stat to go by because none of it was good. Um, in fact, the same applies for Nick Taylor. Nick Taylor, green and reg, decent. Uh, T to green, he was, you know, upper 20 to 40 percentile in the field for T to green. So that works. Streelman was above half, even though he's negative in T to green. Could maybe look at T to green, but if you're not seeing a lot of light green in this in any of these columns, like back to back to back, it's not really a prevalent stat. So it's all over the place once again. That's why I look more at course history and recent form to go with the bucket system. That's how I find my golfers and also the grass stats because grass stats to me far more important than how someone was golfing leading leading up to the tournament. Um, yeah, it was a it was an interesting tournament. I like I said I did well, so I I was pretty excited to see the results. Um, yeah, other than that, I don't have anything anything else to provide. So. I guess with that, thank you for watching, guys. Hope to see you uh, tomorrow when I come up with a preview for the Genesis Invitational. Until then, I will see you later.